Hey guys, welcome to Scrum Master full course video by Simply Learn. In this video, we'll cover some of the most important concepts related to Scrum. We'll talk about what exactly Scrum is, the components of Scrum process, the role of a Scrum Master, the Scrum methodology, how Scrum meetings work, how Scrum and Kanban are different from one another, and finally, we'll cover some important interview questions that will help you ace your interview. Our instructors, Jeff and Chandra, will help you understand the topics with ease. Craving a career upgrade? Subscribe, like, and comment below. Dive into the link in the description to fast track your ambitions. Whether you're making a switch or aiming higher, Simply Learn has your back. Now, let's jump right in. Hi, welcome to Scrum Tutorial from Simply Learn. I am CMR Chandra MR, a professional consultant and coach who is certified Scrum Master, PMP, Prince2 Practitioner, ITL4 Managing Professional, DevOps, and COVID-5. As part of this tutorial, we are going to understand the basic understanding requirements of Scrum, the Agile methodology. So let us look at a problem scenario. What was there in the absence of adoption of Agile in any given environment? So in the given scenario, there is a problem expressed. So we have a problem. Our consumer doesn't like our product. We will have to make changes immediately. So now as usual, any manager would respond the manager says make the changes so because it's always uh, the changes or anything what we deliver is in the consumer's interest so keeping consumers interest in mind the value which needs to be created for customers any changes required to be done in any of our projects involving that consumers and customer we may require to do the change so but what is the problem here to do the change so we can't we already have started work on last batch the waterfall model we follow doesn't let changes to be made midway through the process. So is it mean the waterfall model never allows the changes to happen? That is not true 100%. Waterfall model allows us to make changes, but it doesn't allow us to make the changes quickly. So whenever there is a change, it requires a lot of effort. It requires changes in documentation. It asks for the changes in uh, various different uh, implementations which has already done, which is executed already. And then a lot of efforts are involved, which is time consuming. And also it involves more cost. Now, how do we make that change which is required to the customer? And at the same time, we don't have any specific additional effort which are required. So these efforts, whatever is being put is acceptable to both the parties, both the stakeholders, that is the project organization as well as the customer so how do we make it happen quickly as well that is very important for us so we should have used the agile methodologies so meaning agile methodology helps us to do this so one of the agile methodologies which we are going to look at as part of this tutorial is scrum so let us see how scrum is going to help the scenario so scenario of changes which are coming up more frequently right Right, before that, let us understand what is the meaning of Agile. What is the meaning of Agile? Uh, what it means and why should we adopt Agile? So Agile means moving faster, being flexible, responding to the changes. Now Agile is a set of methods and practices that focuses on iterative development. Why iterative? In each iterations, Agile methodologies helps us to create a working piece of the software product which will help us to make quick corrections to those software piece. This is not a whole product. It is part of that bigger product. So requirements and solutions are obtained thanks to self-organizing cross-functional teams collaborating. So when we say cross-functional team, self-organizing team, so these are the teams which are 7 plus or minus 2, the size of the team what I am speaking about who basically have various different skills. Each of the team members will have various different skills and they complement to it. I think today the DevOps is speaking about this cross-functional team owning everything as a single team. Some of the organizations has already demonstrated their DevOps capabilities by having this approach, like having self-organizing and cross-functional team, having an accountability for the entire product, 
the particular piece of the product module what they have created. So this helps in improving accountability and also ensures better visibility of the product what is being created and delivered. So further let us look at the advantages of using Agile. So what it gives to us, how it helps. So now the organization who follows the Agile methodologies, so we can see that projects follow a predefined schedule and have a predictable cost. So schedules are seen, but wherever there is a changes required, wherever there is a directions need to be changed in terms of making necessary changes to adopt to the required scenario, the change scenario, Agile helps us. It, it gives that flexibility. So clients have visibility of each phase of project. So it is very essential whosoever adopts the Agile methodology, the active involvement of customer has to be ensured. So they are actively involved. So customers or clients actively involved in the sense they know it, what is happening, what they are getting, they know, they are acknowledging it by giving the feedbacks every now and then so that there is no surprise to them at the end, which used to happen during waterfall approaches. Then greater interaction between project team and the project means there needs to be collaboration. Agile emphasizes on having the collaboration. So Scrum in specific have something called uh, daily uh, Scrum where 15 minutes meeting where entire uh, Scrum team should come in, sit together, uh, self-organizing team as well as all that uh, Agile team has to come together, express what they have completed before the last uh, daily Scrum meeting and what is pending, why is it pending and what is that they are going to do before the next meeting. So all these are expressed. This will help the team as well as the scrum master as well as the product owner the visibility into what is complete what needs to be completed and this will help a project manager or scrum master to provide the necessary inputs better visibility to the customers and stakeholders as well product output is predictable and can sometimes happen earlier than expected so now initially as we know so the visibility of anything what we do will be very less so now as we discuss more and more, as we brainstorm more and more, the visibility into it will become more. Then what would happen in future, the ability to predict will also become easier. And it, this doesn't happen only with the project team. It also happens with customers and every stakeholders who are involved in the project. So next, high quality development, testing and collaboration is ensured since the project is broken down. So now each iterations, each uh, module, each piece of uh, software which is being created are tested regularly and feedbacks are obtained from the user as well. Active involvement of user are ensured so that they are acknowledging it. So the what customer needs are given. So it is not that I discover something uh, which I did not need. I am seeing it. I told something, I am getting something. That scenario is eliminated. Then the product backlog can be refined and reprioritized. So since we move uh, iteration wise, depending on the change scenario, depending on the directions changes, we can keep reordering or reprioritizing our product backlog. What needs to be created first? If I have uh, one, two, three, four, five item, I can make it as three, four, one, two, five. So depending on the change scenario, whenever it needs to be executed, it is a bit flexible and easy to do. Then teams can maximize project value since clients can provide project priority. So as we know the visibility also increases to the consumer as well as all the stakeholders. They will also express what is that value they have seen from this and this will also help in making a decision should we continue with this project or should we not. So better visibility, better decision making, better value realization. The needs of the customer can be focused on increasing the value delivered. So as customer gives the feedback, as that visibility increases, then a customer is getting that value and then expressing what is that changes, what is that additionally they may require here, how can we make it better. So these interactions can happen. So customer can be focused on increasing the value delivery. So in fact, I think earlier we used to speak about time to market. Today we are speaking about time to value, which means how quickly uh, the consumers, the users or customers realizes the value. Is that benefit realized? So that's what uh, the more and more discussion which is happening, which requires closer collaboration with consumers and their feedbacks, their experiences with the products or services which are being used by them. It is very essential to understand. So then various different methodologies what we have in Agile. We can speak about Scrum, 
Kanban, Extreme Programming, that is XP, Lean Methodologies, the Crystal. So now, in this video tutorial, we are actually focusing on Scrum. So let us understand what is this Scrum is all about. Right? So before we go and understand what is the Scrum itself, so let us look at the history of Scrum, where it started, how it started. So right down the line, uh, during 1986, the name Scrum is first introduced by the management experts Yukujiro Nonaka and Hirotaka Takuchi. So Japanese. So now this terminology was introduced, but later in 1995, Jeff uh, Sutherland and Ken Schubert creates the early version of what would become the Agile methodologies. So now earlier 1995, so need for Agile was sensed and it was spoken about. I mean, why do we need Agile methodologies in future? What would be the future organization which would look like? So that would trigger in terms of what kind of approaches we may require to have. So further 2001, the Agile Alliance is founded and first look on Scrum, the Agile software development with Scrum is published. So then further uh, down the line 2002, the Scrum Alliance is founded by Sweber and certifications are added. Then uh, later 2006, the Scrum Inc is created. The certified Scrum courses are taught. So people started getting certified on uh, Scrum. Then later 2009, Scrum.org is created, which offers the professionals Scrum series of certifications. Then 2010, the first Scrum guide is published, so which made available to everyone. So from then, I think uh, the more and more people start adopting Scrum methodologies. Now, interesting part is the journey started from uh, 1980s till 2010, various changes which has happened to this particular methodology. But one thing we should keep in mind is, same 20 years back or 15, 20 years back, if we go, the need for Agile was not seen. So it was spoken, but need for Agile was not spoken much. But today we are speaking about it more and more. The reason is, I think, the change in the market condition, the increase in the competition, the need of responding to the change which is asked by the consumers or the market variations has become more and more important for organizations and service providers. If they don't respond to the change, they may lose out in the competition. So their survival is at stake. So it, it is very essential for them to understand these dynamics and respond to those scenarios quickly. So that's where the adoption of Agile, the benefit of adopting Agile were realized and Scrum become popular. So what is Scrum? So let us look at that. So now Scrum is a framework that enables teams to work together. Means collaboration is very important while we become agile. So with Scrum team, one can look, I mean, see and experience. So learning from experiences happens. So those are captured. Self-organize working on problems. So they work together. They discuss, brainstorm. Reflect on their victories means any achievements has to be celebrated, acknowledged, quick wins, recognized and their losses to improve. So wherever the things doesn't go good, necessary corrections has to be done. I think Scrum approach would help in terms of uh, doing it quicker, better. Then some of the benefits using Scrum would look like Steam can provide project deliverables and in an efficient manner. So in time. We are completing all the features and functionality. So the, the entire model, the methodology, what is there, which helps in accomplishing those. Then further, time and money are used efficiently. So time is very important. Giving results in a mentioned schedule is very important. Ensuring results are coming up effectively is important, efficiently. The performance of that products. Now, since we are creating those small piece, working piece in every iterations, so that experience of using that would also be there and quick feedbacks will come back so that time and money is saved and we are doing in time. So projects are divided into smaller units called sprint. So the iterations, what I was speaking about, the quick iterations of activities which happens uh, during the adoption of Scrum when organization adopt the Scrum methodology. So it is called a sprint. It's a time box iterations which will have a set of subset of uh, product backlog taken as a sprint backlog and those users stories and epics are delivered as part of that uh, sprint and then uh, those are reviewed on a daily basis as part of daily scrum meeting and also 
we have other meetings which will happen when we go and look at uh, scrum uh, methodology how this happens i think we'll get better visibility work best for fast moving projects now whenever we need to respond quickly whenever we want to move faster now remember when we say moving faster means it doesn't mean that we can allow any defects to happen we can ignore something we cannot do that we need to ensure everything is taken care at the same time all those results what are created has to be acknowledged right confirm yes it is defect free so all those which is supposed to be addressed are taken care and things are moving faster and better and the results are according to what was actually expressed as a requirement it is fulfilling those then scrum meetings provide the team great visibility since there is a daily scrum meeting which keeps happening people speaks about what they have done from the previous uh, daily scrum what is that they have accepted they will complete and what is complete is everything is complete or something is pending if it is pending why is that pending and what is that you are going to do further before the next daily scrum meeting so these are discussed understood so that there is a quick 15 minutes meeting which gives the insight and further wherever there is a dependency deviations which occurs further may be scrum master sit with them separately in a, uh, to understand that in detail so daily scrum meetings give the quick insights so that it increases the visibility what is happening on ground constantly involves feedback from clients and customers as i mentioned earlier while discussing about agile active involvement of a customer is very essential so customer should give the feedbacks whenever that working piece of the application or a product is given so only then uh, whether the product or that module what is created is uh, having that features and functionality which helps in providing necessary requirement fulfillment is that happening or not then making changes based on feedback are very easy because everyone is informed and they are aware of what is being changed and what needs to be changed then individual efforts of the team members are given focus yes individual efforts is essential at the same time each team member cross skills we call it a self organizing team as i was mentioning earlier so each team member will have a different different skills different different capabilities and also cross skilling within the team is encouraged so that the ownership on individuals uh, deliverables and team as a whole working together to deliver some features functionality can also be accomplished right then scrum team involves product owner scrum master and then scrum team so each of these are different roles having their own objectives to accomplish with the specific directions and each of these cannot be merged like for example the roles and responsibilities of product owner cannot be given to single individual who is a scrum master so both the roles cannot be given a single individual because it conflicts the objectives of both the roles so thinking about putting this one of the team member becoming scrum master or product owner thinking in that angle is also something which is which will not work which will not uh, give the required results so now what are these roles what are the responsibilities where is the focus of each of the roles so let us discuss on that now when it comes to product owner so the product owner is primarily responsible for maximizing the roi by determining the product features prioritizing it into a list what needs to be focused on for the next sprint and constantly reprioritizing and refining it so the key points what we need to see here is so one is determining the product features maximizing the roi the second one and then reprioritizing and refining the product backlog now why is that needs to be done so maximizing roi in the sense obviously product owner should closely work with the business and have an insight towards what is that business require what is that customer require how it helps customer to accomplish that result so that it helps the justifying that investment what they are doing with the products features and functionalities then uh, speaking about reprioritizing and refining it it depends on what features needs to be delivered in what order so there is already an order which is defined so based on the change scenario you can reorder it and product owner has the ownership and responsibility so the entire focus is on ensuring the right product backlog prioritizing it and also adding that user stories and epics into product backlog depending on what makes sense to the business so the scrum master the next role helps teams learn and apply scrum to obtain business value means 
Scrum master closely works with the team. So he or she helps remove impediments. What is impediments? Something which stops to move forward. Something which doesn't allow to deliver things the way it is required. Something which stops. Right? So that needs to be eliminated. That needs to be understood. What are the impediments? So when we say impediments, what are the impediments we can think of? The skills and capabilities of the team. That is one thing. Maybe the testing environment. Maybe a process. So many things comes as a bottleneck or impediments which stops things to move smooth or forward. So Scrum Master should work on it, identify that and support team or guide team to overcome those. So protects them from interfaces that helps the team to adopt agile practices. So encouraging team to adopt agile practices and ensuring they demonstrate it and provides the required value as it moves forward. So since Scrum Master focuses one side in terms of making Scrum team to work, whereas product owner is looking at the entire product backlog and working more closely with the business. So they need to have a good handshake uh, to ensure things go well. But these two roles cannot be merged because since it has a two different angles and two different dynamics, so spending time accomplishing both the things may become very challenging and conflicting. And uh, prioritizing will also be difficult. Then Scrum team is a collection of all the individuals who work together to deliver the requirements of the stakeholders. So self-organizing team, what I was mentioning, what we were discussing earlier. So these teams comes together, each of the team member will have various different capabilities. So they contribute at the individual level and as a team has a whole complement or contribute towards ultimate output and outcome and value what they need to create. And this team should have a clear understanding about the deliverable what is being done. So is that deliverable what features and functionality what they are thinking? Is that going to create that value ultimately? What is need to be achieved? The requirements fulfillment which is which needs to be happened to the customers. So they need to have that understanding. The direction should be clear to the team. So there are certain artifacts to look at when it comes to Scrum. So let us look at that. So now we speak about the artifacts which are the components of the scrum process that can improve transparency and understanding of the work. So there are three artifacts mainly, which we call it as a product backlog, sprint backlog, then product increment. So let us see what is this one by one. So when I say product backlog, so it consists of list of new features, changes to be made to existing features, the bug fixes, changes to the infrastructure and several other activities that the team needs to deliver to ensure a particular outcome. So this list of product backlogs becomes with required features and functionalities what needs to be delivered. So the prioritization of this has to happen in what order what needs to be delivered. So the product backlog is the full list which needs to be delivered as part of this project. And as the project progresses, a lot of uh, new backlog item would be added to the product backlog. Uh, as the dynamics of the particular uh, scenarios keeps changing, so keeps adding, reprioritizing additional uh, items to the backlogs are added depending on what are those dynamics. So further looking at a sprint backlog, so sprint refers to that short period of iterations, right? So uh, which a team aims to get a given amount of work done. So it helps teams deliver working software in a frequent manner. So sprint could be between one to four weeks long depending on what is that deliverable is. So sprint backlog is a subset of product backlogs. So that prioritize item what is taken into sprint which is a time boxed iterations. The sprint backlog contains the task the team aims to complete to satisfy the sprint goal. So what is that sprint goal? So each of those iterations the time box iterations will have a specific objective to accomplish. So the sprint goal is the objective decided for the sprint as an outcome of negotiation between the product owner and the team. So what can be delivered, how long it takes to deliver. So when it has to be delivered, the target may be given by product owner, but is it possible, feasible to complete it? There, there is some negotiation which happens there. So they decide, they agree, yes, we can do it, we cannot do it. If at all we can do it, what is that it takes in terms of effort, time and cost? So everything is decided, discussed. So that objective of that particular iterations is agreed upon. So once it is agreed, I think a team should first identify the tasks from the product backlog that need to be delivered to achieve the goal. 
So these stars are then added to split backlog. So there should be an agreement between both. And once it is added, once it is agreed as part of that sprint, the deliverable, the output of the sprint would be the one which needs to be completed as part of it. The objectives, the goal, the results, it's a specific working software. Then the product increment. So this refers to the combination of all product backlog tasks completed in the sprint and the value of the increment of previous sprints. Now, when we speak about lean, lean speaks about elimination of waste. It speaks about value streams. Now, in each of the sprints, as we have a working software being delivered, now each of these pieces should keep complementing to the what is the one which is already delivered and what is being delivered in future. So, keeping that in mind, every deliverable will be implemented or configured in such a way that there is no specific bottlenecks. There is no specific constraints which arises. So this needs to be kept in mind, which requires the entire visibility into what is that ultimate objective we are going to accomplish. So in this product increment, all those combination of the product backlogs task which is being done should keep this in mind. Team should be very clear about it. So I in the first sprint, I delivered something. In the sprint two, I delivered something, but I cannot integrate them. They cannot work together. It will lead into the further issues and then complications. That should not happen. So when we say agile, it's about moving faster, fine. So responding to change, fine. But that should not lead towards further complexity. It should make things simpler, smoother. So Scrum is stressing on that part. So an increment refers to inspectable, usable work done at the end of the sprint. It represents a step towards overall goal or vision of the project, as I was mentioning. Then the outcome should be in usable condition even if the product owner doesn't decide to release it so it should be in usable condition so two things we speak about so one is uh, release other one is deployment now people usually get confused between release and deployment so release about this part what we're speaking about product is usable so it is released product is usable but only after deployment user will have an access to use it so that is a difference release makes that product usable Whereas deployment makes it available to the user to use. So this difference people should know. So release doesn't mean that it is already available for user to use. So this understanding of the difference should also be there so that one can understand what it means by release as well and what it means by deployment. That's why when we speak about DevOps, we keep speaking about uh, CICD. In CICD, we speak about uh, continuous integration continuous uh, delivery and continuous deployment so in continuous delivery you're speaking about release basically so once it is released it becomes usable so once it is deployed it is available for user to use and that's about the scrum artifacts now let us look at uh, scrum framework how that scrum framework looks like in entirety so what are the components comes into picture already we spoke about the scrum approach itself what it is now we spoke about understanding artifacts, then we spoke about roles in Scrum, the activities for each of the roles we understood. Now where do we see all of this when we look at a Scrum framework? So that picture let us see. So when we say Scrum framework, already we spoke about the product backlog. We can see that it is in the left side in the beginning. We have a sprint planning. So we spoke about sprint, the time box iterations and uh, from the product backlog, the items which is moving towards sprint to a specific sprint what needs to be delivered which become sprint backlog now the backlog items are taken and scrum team work on it and does a daily scrum meeting and once the deliverables of that particular sprint happens then there is a review on it then the increment is delivered and at the same time that retrospective what was planned versus what is delivered that is checked if you look at from sprint review so you have a retrospective to check what is planned versus what is being delivered. At the same time, the review points will come and get updated to product backlog as well to the product owner. So product owner should be aware what is delivered, what is pending to be delivered, and that increment is further delivered. So these increments, what is delivered to production, what is deployed in the production should have values, that integration which happens, both all the increments coming together to provide that fulfillment of the requirement as well as creating that value what is required so product backlog is the first step of scrum framework 
is a set of list of tasks to have successfully achieve the goals of the stakeholders. We we'll discuss that while discussing on product backlog. So further sprint planning happens where the team determines the tasks from the product catalog they will work on and aim to deliver during the sprint. Now this is negotiated, understood, agreed and then most towards sprint to get delivered. Then sprint backlog are the tasks discussed during the sprint planning means the previous step and also during the script planning and then added to the sprint backlog. Once it goes to the sprint backlog as part of the time boxed iteration sprint the deliverables should happen. Now scrum team, the scrum team which is actually self organizing team as we mentioned maybe 5 to 10, 9 members of team working on the task in the sprint backlog and they will also have a daily scrums where the team also discusses for 15 minutes on the events where the team member synchronizes activities and plan what they aim to achieve in next 24 hours what is accomplished against what is discussed in previous daily scrum and then if at all any further discussions need to be done in the correction of those that can be taken as a separate meeting not as part of the daily scrum so generally daily scrum meeting would be 15 minutes it should not go more than that it's an indicative time so quicker updates to understand what is happening then uh, the sprint review happens where uh, once the sprint is complete so sprint review happens which involves the team the scrum master and product owner and stakeholders to understand what is being agreed upon and what is being delivered so reviewed is that fulfilled in the entirety that is discussed and then uh, during this meeting the team shows what they accomplished during the sprint it allows time to ask questions make observations give feedback and provide suggestions right then the product owner also presents the product backlogs talk to the stakeholders to get feedback for upcoming sprints and about things related to the backlog now this one sprint is complete for the next sprint what should be the prioritization so the product owner has to sp speak with the stakeholders so that there is a good understanding good handshake that what needs to be delivered and what is the priority in the given list then sprint retrospective happens so after the sprint review uh, sprint retrospective happens so during this meeting what went well like past mistakes potential issues what are the new ways to handle them which are required to be done correctly in the next uh, iterations or next sprints needs to be identified data from found from here are incorporated when planning the new sprint so it works like a lessons learned what went well what did not go well what is that we did for those what did not go well so what is that learning we have in these iterations so how can we ensure that in the upcoming iterations the same mistakes are, will not repeat so those can be uh, discussed documented and then consider while moving to the next uh, sprint then the increment is a workable output which is given to the stakeholders so this is where the user actually sees their workable piece working item and then they give necessary feedback as well on the particular uh, application piece or software uh, piece then there is something called scrum board which is used during this flow of scrum right from product backlog to the creation of that increment so let us look at what is a scrum board which is used during the scrum practice so a scrum board is a physical or virtual tool that helps team to visualize items in the sprint backlog so it helps in tracking what is being delivered what is in progress and what needs to be delivered further so it shows all action items during the daily scrum helping keeping the team focused on tasks that need to be completion and the priorities of those the scrum board is usually present in a place that's accessible to all team members. It is a visual board, right? And can be physical whiteboard and stickers or virtual software tools which can be used and displayed on the screen. So the scrum board is divided into different slots like to do, in progress and done. So when new sprints are started, the existing board is reset and new scrum board is created. So since it is visual system, I think it is taking the thought from Kanban. So visual system always works effective because the moment I know, I see something is uh, uh, put ag against my name that I need to complete this. It's quite obvious to me that I will put efforts to complete it. So it's a conscious effort what I will put. It works on my consciousness. So something which is not visible to me, it is not out of sight is out of mind. So I will not 
work on it. So I may there is a tendency to forget. First slide here has to do with user stories and ethics. And what I want to do, team, is I want to, before we get into the user stories, I want to go to the whiteboard and I want to just give you a little bit more information that might help us in organizing our discussion that we're about to embark on here. <clears throat> so a word that is not in our slides is themes. Themes are epics and user stories grouped together. You know, similar epics and user stories grouped together for planning purposes. So an epic is big. Um, you would never do an epic in, or pardon me, a theme in a sprint. It's too big. Um, so it's used for planning purposes. Below that, I would put epics. Epics are low priority, large user stories, meaning that an epic will eventually have to be disaggregated into multiple user stories. The reason it would be low priority is because if, it w if an epic was higher up on the product backlog, um, it would have to be more detailed. That's when you would break it down. So epics are usually going to live at the lower uh, priority levels of a product backlog. And as user stories are completed and the epic rises in priority, it will eventually be broken down into um, more manageable user stories. So great big low priority user stories. Then we have user stories themselves. User stories are functions or features that the product owner wants to have developed. A user story turns into working software that provides value to the customer. And, um, and the product owner is the customer voice. The product owner is the one who would accept or reject completed user stories. And then there are tasks. And a reminder, when we were talking about the sprint planning meeting, we said the sprint planning meeting is uh, got two parts to it. The first part is selecting all of the user stories that are going to be included in the sprint and then disaggregating each of those user stories into tasks. That's done in the sprint planning meeting, and then those tasks are the things that are actually then done when the uh, work of the sprint begins. User stories can be estimated in story points or ideal days. Most teams favor story points. They might start with ideal days, but they will then usually end up going to story points. Um, tasks are uh, estimated in I, ideal time, which is usually ours. Okay, so now back to our slides. <clears throat> so to, at the top left, a use case could be an example of a user story. So it's something that um, the user wants to do and how the system should support it. Um, like um, a use case could be um, select and pay for items in a catalog. Now that could actually be an epic or maybe a theme because maybe it would get disaggregated into log on screen, uh, catalog, uh, shopping cart, and checkout. But the, so the use case could either be a standalone user story or it could actually be uh, a number of user stories um, that would result from it below that requirement. It could be a functional requirement, a technical task, or even a bug fix. So I'm gonna go back to the whiteboard and a product backlog is going to have a lot of user stories that come from the customer, right? Whatever the customer wants done. But the team may know that it has to do some development work in order for the user stories to even be able to work. You know, there's some system level non-functional requirements that need to be done. And so there could be tech user stories. And then, can you see this low? 
I can't see your chats, but then there could also be defect user stories. There could even be risk user stories. Now, what could happen is that um, the product owner ranks these in priority. So this one first, then that one, then that one. And the team says, well, the only thing is, is that um, we have to do some development work before we can actually do user story two. And so what we really need to do is insert that before the, uh, the second priority user story. And so the priority of the user stories in the product backlog while it might start with just being, you know, simple functional user stories coming from the uh, product owner, it will evolve until it includes some other things that are also considerations when it comes to uh, priorities because of, you know, successor, predecessor relationships, dependencies, and things like that are um, considerations. <clears throat> A user story, be, uh, back to the, the uh, screen, um, bottom left now, the user story um, can use a fictitious user or a persona to help uh, the team or the, the team and the product owner to get an idea of, okay, who's going to be doing this function? Uh, what are they going to need in order to be able to complete the function, et cetera? So you try and um, come up with an actual, well, a fictitious, but a person who's actually doing it to kind of get out of the realm of, you know, listing requirements and, you know, specs and things like that and say, okay, what's the user experience need to look like? Top right, template. A portion of a user story is, um, let me back up. So a user story card um, is usually going to contain um, a brief description of the user story using some kind of a meta language format, like we're suggesting right here. As a user or persona, I want this feature so that I can. So not unlike our um, estimating session here. As a frequent traveler, I want to eat grapes so I can be healthier. In the one that we uh, didn't do, uh, the inventory system, as a customer, okay, there's a, a user. I want to get cash back so I don't have to wait in line at the bank. Okay, here's another user story. As a consumer, I want the shopping cart functionality to easily purchase items online. And maybe that could be customer as well. Um, as an executive, right, as a suit, I want to generate a sales report so I know which departments need to improve their productivity. As a buyer, so you can see I, I tried to come up with these different roles right here, executive, buyer, sales rep, etc. <clears throat> And that's the format. As a type of user, I want some kind of goal um, or feature, and uh, so that's some kind of a reason. Um, the, below that, connect. Connect the dots by writing all of the user stories necessary to uncover the entire use case. So like we were talking about right here, if you want to be able to purchase items online from a catalog, that might be uh, uh, multiple user stories in order to support that use case. And so, of course, um, we would want to be able to connect the dots and see where all the user stories fit in into the overall goal of the project or release. And the stories, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, are grouped to form an epic or higher level story, so epic or theme. Um, stories can then be split into child stories or tasks, and so that's what we were covering before, right? So you have um, themes up at the top. That's the biggest grouping, if you will, used primarily for um, you know uh, high-level planning purposes. So you have your themes, then you have your epics, which are large user stories, um, low priority, and they're going to have to be broken down into smaller user stories. Like in the question that we had at the end of the, the last section where 
um, the product owner needed something done, and the team said, well, based on the size of this user story, it's going to take three sprints to do. Well, a user story has to be small enough to be completed within a single sprint. So a sprint can contain more than one user story, but a user story cannot stand sprints. So that feature or function that was in the question was probably more like an epic. It was something that would need to be uh, disaggregated into smaller user stories, or perhaps it was more of a use case that would need more than one user story in order to actually deliver the overall use case. Let's see, as a product supervisor, I want to see an unfinished part list at the end of the day so that I can reallocate work the next day. Great user story description. Well done, Viraj. Um, did you hear that, team? As a product supervisor, I want to see an unfinished part list at the end of the day so I can reallocate work the next day. That is a well-crafted description of a user story. Now, here are some things that I want you to memorize. You were hoping I was done with the memorization part. So I want you to um, remember that we have to invest in our user stories. And I was going over to the whiteboard and I didn't change cameras, so let me do that. I recommend um, you know, figuring out how you memorize best so that you can, if, um, well, not if you wanted to, what I recommend is being able to write out all of this stuff on plain white scrap paper in about 14 minutes because that's the amount of free time you have in the tutorial when you're at the, uh, or when you're taking the test. Um, Exin does it a little bit different. You maybe won't have a tutorial. The only time you'd have a tutorial is if you were at a center taking a test. Um, Exin has other options, like you can do a paper-based test um, uh, where you get a third party, you know, a buddy or somebody who will agree to sort of proctor the test for you, or you can do it on your laptop all by yourself, and they have software that watches you while you're taking the test, and they require you to take the laptop and do like a 360 so that um, they can verify that you don't have any cheat sheets up on the wall or anything like that. But the point is, is um, you got to have this memorized, um, whether you're going to dump it out on the paper or not. Um, when I took the test, um, I actually did the paper-based option, um, and that was because of some time constraints, and it was the quickest way to get me into the test. And so I didn't write out any of the stuff I'd memorized, but I had it memorized, and I had it memorized well enough that I could kind of recall it in my mind's eye. Okay, so we're talking about user stories, and you have to invest in your user stories. You know I like memorizing things by creating these charts that have the first letter of the word or phrase that you're memorizing in a separate column, and then I make up a story, you know, that uh, – um, reminds me that I've got to have I-N-V-E-S-T. This one is pretty easy. Probably just invest works. Um, but th So let's go over that. I stands for independent. Independent meaning that each user story stands on its own. Um, you don't have – when we're doing Scrum, you don't do a user story that won't result in working software. We just talked about the description of user stories, right? So it's a user that needs some kind of functionality for some kind of a reason, and they're all independent. Will they work together? Of course they'll work together if that's a necessity, but um, if you developed a logon screen, you could demonstrate working software for the login screen. There might be another user story that is, um, you know, has to do with displaying uh, the catalog and being able to flag or select items that you want to purchase. But there'd be working software for that. Would they work together? Yes, but each user story would complete um, or result in some kind of working software, and they have to be independent. Negotiable. Negotiable in the way the user story is going to be implemented. 
the product owner doesn't dictate to the team. The team doesn't say it, it's only this way and we don't want to hear anything from you. So there are discussions about the size and implementation for each user, user story. So the product owner can't make it so detailed that there's no room for discussion and the possibility of, you know, the team coming up with solutions other than what the product owner was attempting to dictate. Um, v stands for valuable, meaning each user story has to create value for the customer or the end user. E it has to be estimable, as in estimatable, except estimatable is not really a word. It's estimable. Um, and S is for small, has to be small enough to be done in a single sprint. If we're doing two-week sprints, has to be able to be done in two weeks or less. If we're doing four-week sprints, it could be a larger user story, but it would still uh, have to be done in four weeks or less. And then the last one, the T, is testable. Every user story needs to be testable, and it needs to be testable at two levels. Remember our triangle? It needs to be testable at the intrinsic quality level, unit tests, et cetera and also testable at the extrinsic level, which is the customer point of view, which is acceptance. So every user story uh, has to be testable. Okay, so that's invest, and so let's add that to our list of things to memorize, invest. And then the next one we have here is um, the three C's of a user story. So the first C team is card. So user stories should be able to be written on a four by six inch index card or some uh, media similar to that card. <clears throat> the, the second C is conversation. The user story card is the item that is used for the team and the product owner to talk and discuss in order to make sure that the product owner and the team are on the same page when it comes to what is actually supposed to be developed and um, uh, what you know, so what it's supposed to look like at the end, which leads us to the third one, which is confirmation. Each user story essentially has to have acceptance tests um, in it itself. So card four by six conversation, that's the starting point. That's where uh, the team and the product owner discuss. And then eventually there will be acceptance tests included on the user story card um, in order to be used during the sprint review to um, assure that it's acceptable, that there's confirmation. Okay, so, oh, let's add that to the memorization list. So, three C's. All right, now I've got an example here of a user story card. So we're looking right here, and if you were to go out on the internet and search um, user story cards, um, they would be similar. There would be some differences, of course, um, <clears throat> but typically what you're going to have is you're going to have a title or a name for the user story, and then there's going to be some kind of unique identifier, like user story 321. Then there will be the description like we just talked about. As a librarian, I want to have the facility of searching a book by different criteria so that I will save time while serving a customer. Then there might be some other descriptive words or links to other information that might be necessary. And then there would be acceptance criteria or tests Sometimes these get included on the back of the card, but the point is, is that they are on the cord, on the card rather. Then there will be an estimate of size. It could be ideal days or story points. As I mentioned, most teams do story points. That's more likely what you'll be tested on as opposed to 
um, ideal days, but you know we'll cover both so you understand uh, the differences. <clears throat> Um, there is probably – it's not listed here, but there's probably going to be a um, value point assignment. This is where the product owner um, kind of determines in a relative way the uh, value of the stories. Just like we were doing in planning poker, the product owner might say, well, this story is twice as valuable as, a, as uh, this other one comparing them together. And this is what um, these value points are what's used to uh, prioritize the user stories. That's supposed to be a V, as in value points. And then typically there's also going to be a indication, sometimes it's just by colors, um, it could be words uh, that has to do with, um, you know, where the story came from. Did it come from the customer? That would be considered a functional requirement. Um, if it came from the team, that would be from the technical domain. I'm trying to write where from. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not me, team. It's the mouse. Clearly, <laughs> it's hard to uh, do that. That's from, where from. Um, here it's got uh, customer tech. You could also have defect. You could maybe have risk. Um, and then there's also going to be an X factor, um, which would be <clears throat> some kind of word probably like um, stable, um, erratic, um, incomplete, something like that. To, uh, so that the team is designating the user story in uh, respect to the amount of uncertainty or risk that's associated with that user story. And because all of that's a part of the story, right? The story is going to be turned into working software. There may need to be uh, some efforts to actually figure out how to actually do that user story. <clears throat> so that's the X factor. Um, over to the right here on the same chart, we have some comments about um, if you are using a uh, software package, excuse me, like Trello or Jira or something like that, excuse me, <clears throat> the user story cards will generally be able to contain more information using, you know, dynamic links and things like that. Um, could even include things like a responsible team member or depending on how you're doing it, you would break the user story down into tasks and you might have team members assigned to various tasks for the user story. Um, okay, so that's typically what a user story card is like. Sometimes they're cards, sometimes they're like on sticky notes and they're put up on a Kanban board if you're using Kanban to track the project. <coughs> If you have a story that is too large to be completed in a sprint, it's going to have to be subdivided, or we call it disaggregation, into um, smaller user stories. And there's uh, three ways that we're proposing here that you could go about doing that. You could split it based on operational boundaries. For example, as an operator, one needs to manage reservations, which could be split. For example, there could be one portion that is uh, that has to do with making a reservation, another one that has to do with modifying it, and yet another one that has to do with canceling it. So um, that could be split into, in this construct here, three separate user stories. You could also separate based on exceptions or cross-cutting concerns. For example, in the beginning, develop only one main path, like accept repayment for a loan. Then address exceptions, like what if a person um, overpays? Then um, come up with a user story that recognizes that and processes a refund and or gives the option of allocating the overpayment to a future payment or something like that. And then also um, um, adds on other concerns like the check access restrictions or record name of operator. So maybe, um, you know, when you're working on uh, accepting payments or processing refunds, it's going to check 
on um, who the operator is or track that so that if at a later time, you know, who is it that gave this uh, refund here? Well, you could look and see, you know, okay, the, the operator's name was recorded. Or maybe you put some restrictions so that maybe not everybody um, is allowed to do a refund. And so you would have levels of users that have different privileges. Okay, and then down at the bottom, split based on data boundaries. For an example, you know, as an accountant, one needs to enter balance sheet information, um, which could then be split into summary information and separately um, uh, receivable details, or, you know, maybe you could have AP, you know, so you could have different portions of the overall um, balance sheet um, activities that need to be done. So enter AR, enter AP, etc. Make sense? So just to kind of uh, prompt you, give you some ideas about what to do um, in a Scrum project if you have the scenario arise where a user story is being estimated by the team and it won't fit into a sprint. It's too big. Now, when it comes to determining value for user stories, this is primarily owned by the uh, product owner, right? And it always comes back to money, but money, you know, the value can be looked at from different points of view. So new revenue, obviously, you know, getting new customers and having them buy stuff. Um, well, below that, there's another consideration, incremental revenue. Uh, so somebody's in the process of placing an order. Um, maybe there are some premium features that could be add-ons at that point in time um, or maybe added later on. So you have an existing customer who actually buys um, more of or enhanced parts of the existing thing they already purchased or are in the process of purchasing. Retained value. So this is um, – you know, retaining customers so that they don't go to a competitor. And then the bottom one is operational efficiency. You know, how could things be done to speed up the process of whatever it is um, so that the cost of delivering uh, the product is reduced? So this then leads us to a discussion about priorities, recognizing that there are some priority concerns that come from both the customer domain as well as the technical domain. And there are some prioritization models. Um, if we look right here, there is value-based prioritization, and the hierarchy of that would be high value followed by high risk, followed by high value, and then low risk, followed by low value, and then low risk. So, you know, we might have written this a little bit differently, but that's value-based prioritization, and this is primarily the product owner with maybe some input from the team just simply deciding um, what he or she wants done most, listening to the team say, well, you know, there's some, you know, greater risks with this user story than that. And so you'd probably want to uh, persuade the product owner to take care of high risk stuff first, um, because that would have an, <clears throat> a, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, an impact on the future things that need to be done. There's the, the Cano model. Uh, which looks at each of the user stories and classifies them as being mandatory, linear, or exciters. And the mandatory items are those user stories that are musts. And they'll never move beyond, move the customer or the end user beyond neutral. It's if they're not there, it creates dissatisfaction. If the, the, you, the product owner and the team has done a good job in identifying what are the mandatory or threshold items, um, you would see that um, um, it just gets it to neutral. That's what's expected for the product. Linear items, um, user stories, are those user stories that as they are implemented, 
progressively throughout the project and add it to the feature set, it will linear increase customer satisfaction. And it can be, you know, in their absence, dissatisfaction all the way up to high implementation, creating a great deal of satisfaction for the customer. And then the third category is exciters and delighters. Um, and those are features or functions. Those are user stories that are not mandatory. And the absence of them will never result in satisfaction going below neutral. But by adding them, um, you could create excitement and delight for the customer. These would typically be things that are features that would be included in a premium version of the product or maybe add-ons that are promoted, you know, at the point of sale. You know, have you thought about this? Because it'll really help you or whatever. So that's the Cano model. And then there's Uyghur's relative weighting method. And um, this is all using numbers. So each feature is given a value for its benefit and its penalty, given a value for penalty, meaning what's the pain if that feature or function is not included. And then there is um, um, the cost side and the risk side. And then those are all calculated together, and that results in, excuse me, a ranking or a hierarchy, which gives you the uh, priority for the uh, user stories. Um, we also talked about Moscow, didn't we? Did we talk about Moscow? Uh, Moscow is another prioritization model. Must, could. I said that differently. Must, should, could, won't. Moscow, M-S-C-W. Must, should, could, won't. And we talked about that one. <clears throat> Thank you for that confirmation. Does it seem like a long time ago or is it just me? I know it was just last weekend, but <laughs> it's like last year. Okay, so now let's talk about velocity. Um, uh, Priyanka, that is exactly right. Um, <clears throat> So velocity is the capacity of the team to complete work in a single iteration. So the team has estimated the user stories uh, for size or ideal days, and um, the sprints are going to be three week, weeks in duration. Obviously, not all user stories can be completed in a single sprint and be done with the project. Well, I guess maybe I shouldn't say obviously when I'm saying that. I'm thinking, well, maybe you had a very small, short duration project, so you could. But the point is is that uh, it's the team's capacity to um, complete work in a given sprint. And it is an observation. It's not a prediction. So if we're working on sprint five, and we're working on determining what our velocity is, then um, it would be the average of the previous four sprints. If there were any uh, outliers, you, you would uh, disregard those. Um, and so it's an observation. If we look over to question, or, uh, box number two here, velocity is used to deal with um, determining how many user stories we are going to include in a given sprint, and also how many sprints are we going to need to create a release or a set of user stories. And here's an example. In box number three, a team completed five user stories that were sized five, three, eight, 13, and two. Two user stories, each sized five, were left half complete. What is the velocity of the team? And the answer is either going to be 31 or 36. 31 is the sum of the completed user stories. Um, if you were 36, you were claiming half of the two that were five. 
so that would be a total of 10. So you claim half of it, which would be five, would take you to 36. But it's not going to be 36 because the only thing that counts towards progress is working software. So even if the team had finished nine out of 10 story points for a user story, meaning it's almost done and then the sprint ends, that doesn't get counted towards velocity. And you don't mess around with velocity. Um, you can mess around with your estimating and you can mess around with um, you know, what user stories are going to be completed in a sprint, but you don't, the, the velocity is not variable. It is what it is based on past performance. When it comes to levels of planning, we have what's called the planning onion. And let me walk you through this here. <clears throat> Up at the, the broadest area is the vision level. So the vision level, that's the suits, right? They're the ones that have the strategy and objectives for the company and where it's going. And so they have that overall big vision for the uh, company, which is likely going to include products. And each product should have a roadmap. My example of that website that I'm uh, working on has uh, three versions um, which make up the product roadmap. Version one is the free site, version two is the membership site, and version three is the, um, uh, the pay referral commissions uh, uh, version of the site. And the product roadmap is then supported by releases. So for my project, I have three releases. So all of the user stories needed for the free version are in release one. All of the additional user stories that are needed for the um, uh, paid version, the subscriber version, uh, and then also for version three, those are all releases, three releases. And then for each sprint, we will be pulling user stories from the release that we're working on. A release is likely going to take multiple sprints. And, um, and then the sprints are populated by the individual user stories, which are then disaggregated into tasks. And we do the, excuse me, the daily scrum, which is the daily level of planning and coordination. So we call that the planning onion. We already kind of talked about the release and roadmap um, concept here. So let's just review this quickly. Um, prioritize high level epics and determine goals and releases. So we'll use epics and themes in order to group things together. You know, what should be included in what's released? So what are the goals for the releases? Then the first bullet point, establish goals of release based on market demand, regulatory needs, or customer expectations. For each release, you want to estimate the target stories, repeat until the target stories are assigned an iteration length. I should, that's, it's blending some things here. Um, be able to estimate velocity and then uh, assign stories to the sprints. So we keep estimating the user stories and we keep organizing uh, that until we can do that. We can come up with an iteration length, a sprint length, and then figure out what our velocity for each sprint is and then uh, assign stories to the, uh, the sprints. Uh, the, the next bullet down, iterate until the user stories and release date meets conditions of satisfaction. So that's uh, definition of done or acceptance for the release and try not to pack too much into a release backlog. So, um, just like you would not want to pack too many user stories into a sprint. You want to have the timelines appropriate and uh, what are included in the uh, events uh, make sense. Okay, so here's a bit more about release planning on this slide here. Um, you've got the product backlog here on the left, and then we might come up with a release plan, which could be flipped and could be looked at uh, horizontally. And you probably plan um, about three releases in advance. 
um, or at least you're doing more of the detailed planning on that. Uh, because things are going to emerge when we do, you know, sprint one that's going to help in sprint two and things that happen in sprints one and two that are going to help um, release three. And then you've got, um, you know, your subsequent releases where we're just doing very high level planning. It's called rolling wave planning, where we do detailed planning for things in the future in tandem with doing high level planning for things in uh, the future. Did I say that right? Detailed planning for things in the near term in tandem with high-level planning for things in the future. Um, and we talked about deciding as late as possible, I believe, meaning that it's better to actually plan the later uh, releases <clears throat> uh, for purposes of uh, making sure we have more information, uh, the most information available. Okay, so estimation. Let's start at the top left. The principles behind estimation understand the cone of uncertainty, which is an estimate or best guess to begin with and then progressively becomes more accurate. In fact, let's just take a break and look at the cone of uncertainty. So at the very beginning of a project, there's going to be a high level of uncertainty. Um, if I were to draw this chart, I would make it a little bit more like this. So clearly you're going to de-risk the project as early as you can and then eventually all risk disappears when the project is done. Risk is uncertainty. Okay, below that the only estimate that matters is the one given by the team supported by this uh, comment here, nothing is impossible for the one who doesn't have to do it. So the product owner is like, team, come on, you can do this. The team's like, no, we know what our velocity is. No, the product owner says, I'm telling you, I, there's no way that that can't be done. I know you can do it. I trust you. I believe in you. <laughs> but the product owner doesn't have to do, have to do the work. Okay, top right, overestimation and underestimation is always going to be an issue that we deal with. It's more likely that we will underestimate than overestimate. And by looking at our velocity from iteration or sprint to sprint, um, there could be some information that is um, showing us that we're underestimating, for example, meaning um, we're thinking we, you know, the user stories are smaller than they are and that we can get, you know, a certain number done in a sprint and then there's a fail. Well, that would mean then that would be discussed during the retrospective and then we would do something different going forward, which might include doing some re-estimating. Scrum estimating is not necessarily more difficult. However, Scrum exposes bad estimates sooner, which is a good thing. When we were doing our um, uh, planning poker, you could see that um, the first time as a team, you know, we didn't know each other. We didn't know everybody's thoughts and concerns. And those kinds of things, you know, get shared and absorbed as a project goes on. And so there's a higher awareness of that. So um, what we would say is that um, using estimation techniques, scrum estimation techniques might be um, more inaccurate at the beginning of a project, but they will quickly become very accurate as the um, project advances forward. <clears throat> Let's see, is there a question here? Can velocity be increased over a period of time for the project? Yes, it can. Now, it's not that it can't, it will increase if the team is learning how to work together better and better. You would expect that, if I can just use my mouse here, if we were tracking velocity, so this would be um, points completed over here. Uh, let me just do PTS for points. And down here is time. And we go from sprint to sprint, right? You would expect that maybe 
you know, the first couple of sprints, the team would be learning how to work together and there would be a steep curve and then it would kind of flatten out and maybe have, you know, a slow rise going forward as the team emerges as a high performing team. They get better at their cross uh, functional behavior. You know, somebody's sick, the team just keeps chugging along. Um, other things, you know, just, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> There, I had bumped the thing on my screen there. Um, <clears throat> um, so the team, you know, learns how to work better together, and you know their estimates become more accurate, etc. And you would expect a high a high performing team to have a uh, a result like this for velocity where there's quick improvement, and then it kind of stabilizes and then begins to tick upwards. Okay. We talked about the cone of uncertainty. Let's talk about ideal time. Um, when we do estimating for user stories, um, we do it in ideal days. When we do estimating for tasks, we do it in ideal time, which means hours. I think that's on the whiteboard or it was on the whiteboard. Oh, it was on it. Um, so ideal time is the amount of time it takes to complete a piece of work. But that's based on the notion that the team member or members are available to do just the work with no distractions or anything at all. So assuming that um, Priyanka could sit down at a keyboard and code for eight hours without taking a break for lunch, no phone calls, no discussions, no meetings of any kind, just work eight hours. How much could be done in that eight hours by Priyanka? That's what ideal time is. But the thing of it is, is that there is no such thing as somebody being able to spend every minute of every day only doing work. There will be um, distractions. So it has to be converted into elapsed time. Now, we don't convert it to elapsed time at the user story level, but we do convert it to elapsed time when we are dealing at the task level. And what that looks like is, you know, for each team member, you're going to have to do it separately because some team members have more distractions than others. Some might have other duties that pull them away. Um, whatever the case may be, um, you determine how much time in a given day a team member is available to do work. So say it's five hours out of eight for one. Maybe it's six hours out of eight for another. Maybe it's four out of eight, but you figure out what it is, and then you take the average and that average availability is used then to convert ideal time into elapsed time. Um, I should have circled this box here because we talked about this as well. Um, and then I already mentioned this here, only considers actual work time, not the distractions. So that's the concept of ideal time. When it comes to story points, it's different than that. They are a measure of size relative to each other. So we were doing planning poker this morning where um, we were looking at grapes versus apples and then we were looking at oranges and, and what else do we have? Watermelons and coconuts. And we weren't trying to figure out how much time it would take to eat grapes as opposed to how much time it would uh, take to eat a coconut. It's clear that it's going to take longer to eat a coconut because there's more effort involved. So we have a sense that it's going to take more time. But comparing the coconut to our baseline of two, right, we came up with a baseline of two for the smallest user story. We compare eating coconuts to that baseline and we say, okay, you know what, it's going to take more effort to uh, eat the coconut than it is to eat uh, grapes or apples. <clears throat> Um, so you can do it like we did. You can also triangulate. Um, for example, when we did our planning project this morning, or this morning for me, rather, at the beginning. Um, oh, that's not it. 
That is the daily stand-up. Here it is. If I had said, team, I want you to pick a small user story, a medium user story, and a large user story. Um, and then we would then compare other stories to those three, and so we would kind of triangulate on it. Um, let's say that we did, uh, you know, two was small. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Grapes was small, apples were medium, and coconuts were large. Well, if we then looked at orange and we said, well, you know, orange is um, smaller than apples but bigger than grapes. So we would know this would fit in between grapes and apples. Um, and so let's say, you know, we had apples at five and grapes at two, then we would say an orange is probably going to be three. And the values, you know, now I used um, in our example, the modified Fibonacci series. Uh, what we do in Scrum and Agile, if we're using story points, we're going to use um, a nonlinear scale for the values. So down at the bottom here, there's the modified Fibonacci sequence. The way the Fibonacci sequence works, by the way, um, um, it's the, the value is the sum of the two on the right. So let me break this right here because this is a modified Fibonacci. So 13 is 5 plus 8. 8 is 3 plus 5. 5 is 2 plus 3. And 3 is 1 plus 2. If we were doing the real Fibonacci series, this wouldn't be 20. It would be 13 plus 8, which would be 21. Um, I, I don't know why some use modified Fibonacci and others not, but that's just kind of a common thing to do. If you're doing planning poker, you give everybody seven cards, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, and 20. Um, another nonlinear scale is doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16. Um, you typically don't go too far to the left with the values because um, that either means that you're being too granular or you've got stories that are probably too big and they need to be disaggregated. Now, somebody just chatted here, um, should some buffer time be included in the actual estimates? Um, <clears throat> let me answer that question first by going back to ideal time and then I'm going to come back to story points and answer the question. When we're estimating in ideal time, we don't add a special amount of time that we would call a buffer. We just allow for the distractions and the interruptions, which could look like a buffer, right? You're saying, you know, um, you know, Priyanka, if um, based on your duties in the organization and our uh, workday of eight hours, you're typically available to be doing your project work five out of those eight hours. So when we are converting ideal time to elapsed time, um, you know, we will be building in extra time based on distractions and interruptions. We would not call it a buffer, but that's essentially what we're doing. Now, when it comes to user stories that we're using story points, it is different. Um, the points, are for the entire amount of the work. And why might we need to have some extra time for a user story? Well, it's likely going to be driven by uncertainty. There might be other uh, things that impact it, but that's the main thing. <clears throat> Sorry, team. So when the team is estimating the size of the user story, they will be including in their discussion and estimates any extra time or buffer time that would be needed for uh, that user story to be completed. So do we accommodate um, uncertainty when we're using story points? Yes, we're looking at the, the X factor. And if we've got an unstable user story, then we're probably going to um, say, you know, this is going to be a bigger user story than one that's similar but has a, a much lesser level of uncertainty. Um, so that's the story points. Let's compare the two. Um, ideal time uses things like hours and days, which is easier to explain outside the team, right? The suits like things in days and hours. 
everybody's estimate may be different. Not a bad thing. It's easier to do at the beginning because we're oriented to think about time. Um, and it does kind of shine a light on wasted time. Story points um, are harder to explain outside the team. Um, you know, the suit says, well, um, how long is it going to take to do user story 301? And our answer is, um, well, that's a 10 user story point user story. And the suit's saying, what does that mean? Tell me how long <laughs> it's going to take. Um, so the suits have to be converted to uh, uh, story points. Now, here's the thing. It's a lot easier to get consensus when we're estimating in story points. And once we get good at it, it's going to be much faster. We have to remember it's not comparable across teams. So, you know, a team working together will have its own kind of system for sizing the stories. And another team that might even be working on the same project will have a whole, a whole different uh, scheme. And so if the velocity of one team is 25 and the velocity of another is 50, it doesn't mean that the team with the velocity of 50 is able to do more work than the teams whose velocity is 25. And we did, um, when we got our day going, um, we started with um, uh, a planning poker exercise. And so, you know, we used all of the team members. So we selected the team. The product owner was there to answer any questions. Um, the team discussed each of the story cards and then um, decided what their vote was going to be. And then everybody voted at once. If there were outliers, they were discussed. And um, the reasons for that, uh, those variances, those outliers, um, were then part of the discussion. And then we did another round of voting. And we would keep doing that until we had our estimates converge or we reached consensus on them. Okay, so advantages of planning poker. It's fun. It's quick. It gets the whole team involved. The, the team understands um, – a little bit about all of the stories. Everybody contributes his or her expertise, and the discussion during the estimation provides clarity in the direction approach and even a bit of design. If we were in the same room team and we were doing a planning poker activity like we did uh, at the beginning of our day uh, together, um, we would be able to you know, model it a little bit better. Or if we tried to unmute everybody, but you could hear the background noise. I've tried doing it. It doesn't really work. But you get the idea that if the team's discussing and things like that, you would actually get to the point where um, your estimates would converge and the team would say, okay, this user story size is, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so we need to wrap things up for the day. So we are ending right here. And that means tomorrow when we get together, we're going to be doing slide 20. You're starting with that, which is affinity estimating. And let's see, affinity estimating, we go through that. We're going to talk about tracking progress using um, information radiators. And then we're going to talk about what we do when we find variances between the plan and the actual results, and then we'll have our quiz. Now let's talk about the values of Scrum. Now this is different than pillars. This is um, values. So there are five um, <clears throat> values for that, and this is something that I want you to memorize. So I'm going to switch my cameras here and go to the whiteboard, and we're going to add to our list Oh, wrong color. You can tell I'm a project manager because that would bother me. So the five values of Scrum, and there's an acronym. You can see that on the screen, right? C-Force. <clears throat> Okay, so five values of Scrum. And C, F, O, R, C. And you kind of know my style here. You don't have to do it this way. You know, whatever works for you. 
but have some kind of a strategy for memorizing things. It will probably serve you well. So the, um, the first C is commitment. The next one, there are four, <laughs> four, F is focus. O is openness. Is that two ends or one? I don't know, openness. We'll blame it on the marker if it's not right. Um, R is for respect. And the last C is courage. And so there's your little chart right there. And um, let me just briefly go over these. Um, none of these will be a big surprise here. Um, we've talked about some of them already in one context or another. <clears throat> um, so the, for commitment, that means the, commit, the team is going to commit to deliver value to the customer. Um, they're on board, there's the buy-in, all of that's there. Focus, the team is going to focus on the few important things um, at a time. So we're going to do time boxing, uh, we're not going to do things broadly, specifically uh, focus on a few things at a time. O is openness, that's analogous to the T, transparency, and the pillars, meaning we're going to be completely open in sharing um, information about the project, our own opinions, our fears, our concerns, etc. R stands for respect, and that's kind of a 360 view. We respect ourselves, we respect others, we respect the uh, concepts that we are using as part of Scrum, and um, <clears throat> Um, and you know, and we respect the other stakeholders as well, 360. And the last C stands for courage, and that's the courage to make commitments uh, even when we're in an uncertain environment. Um, courage to deal with um, fear that comes from a failure, uh, courage to uh, share disagreements openly yet respectfully, um, courage to participate in debating technical approaches, etc. Okay, so now let's go to the Scrum Lifecycle chart, and what I want to do is I want to elaborate on this just a little bit. And I'm going to try and use my mouse to do some <laughs> some uh, additions to this. Um, first of all, we have the product backlog. The product backlog has to be kept current, and we call that grooming. Grooming is adding user stories and removing user stories from the product backlog. Product backlog is the scope of the project. The product owner owns that. The team assists in that effort. Related to grooming is pruning. Pruning the backlog is prioritizing and reprioritizing. So the product backlog is pruned and groomed regularly throughout the course of the project. Now. There is a meeting that takes place right here, which is called the Sprint Planning Meeting. Can I just do P, S, P here? Sprint Planning Meeting. Okay, that is one of the ceremonies or events that um, takes place in Scrum. In the, um, the Sprint Planning Meeting, it is a time-boxed event, and it is time-boxed to two hours for each week of the sprint. So in our example here, we have a 30-day sprint. So if we have a four-week sprint, then our sprint planning meeting will be eight hours in duration. And two things happen during the sprint planning meeting. The user stories that are going to be included in the sprint are selected. Right? They're put into the sprint backlog, which is a subset of the product backlog containing the user stories that are going to be completed during the sprint. And the second thing that happens during the sprint planning meeting is the selected user stories are then disaggregated into tasks and estimated. 
Once that's done, then the work of the sprint begins. There will be a daily scrum like we did at the beginning of our work day together as our team. And then at the end of the work of the uh, sprint, there will be the sprint review. The sprint review meeting or ceremony is also time boxed and it is time boxed to one hour for each week of the sprint. So if we're doing a four-week sprint, the sprint review meeting would be four hours in length. The primary purpose of the review is to showcase and demo the software and get feedback from relevant stakeholders and allow the product owner to say, I accept or I reject the work that has been done. Then, after that is the sprint retrospective. Now, this is where the team asks and answers three questions. What went well? What did not go well? And what are we going to do different going forward regarding the previous sprint that was just completed and the ones that is, is just coming up? Um, and then the uh, the sprint itself will result in working software or value for the customer. And then, of course, everything goes back and repeats for as many sprints uh, as necessary to complete the scope of the project. Um, let's see. I see a chat here. How similar or different is the product backlog to SRS, software requirement specs document, which is widely used in projects? Um, it's different. Um, and if you will hang on to that question, um, we're going to have a discussion later on about user stories, and that will help you understand uh, the differences. Um, and we'll get into the user stories that come from the customer and user stories that come from the tech domain, and that will help answer your question. So you okay hanging on to that? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so a um, little bit more detailed view of the Scrum project lifecycle. Now let's talk about a couple other things here. When it comes to um, a sprint, there are some things that affect the duration of the sprint. So the team is going to have to decide how long each of the sprints are going to be, and things that are a factor include the stability of the product backlog. If the product backlog is changing a great deal, um, then that's going to argue for shorter durations um, because there's uh, a high level of uncertainty, and so you have a greater amount of control on your project if you have shorter sprints. Now, on the other hand, another factor is the cost of iterating. Every time we do a sprint, there are costs associated with the sprint planning meeting, the sprint review, the sprint retrospective, right? People show up to those meetings, you got to pay them. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so there, there is an overhead cost to actually doing sprints. The goal of the sprint is working software. At the end, the end product should be near releasable or potentially shippable. Now, there might be working software that the product owner isn't going to want to release, um, maybe because it, as a standalone component of working software for the system, doesn't create any value or any usability for end users. Uh, and maybe you wait till the end of a release before you release everything. But the idea is that it's working software and it could be released if um, the customer wanted to do that. <coughs> um, Sorry, I just dropped something. I see a question there. I will circle back to your question in just a sec. Um, the sprint duration and deliverables do not change once the team has committed. This is another one of those things that has to be viewed as absolute when we're doing Scrum. So if we say that we're going to do a two-week sprint and we select five user stories, 
based on our velocity or capacity. Once that decision has been made, the duration of the sprint does not change and we do not add or remove any user stories. Now, it could be possible for the product owner to cancel a sprint, but that would be extreme. That would be because there is such a major change to the product backlog that the work of the current sprint is going to be completely irrelevant. You don't change the sprint, you cancel the sprint. And then the bottom one here, the sprint begins with planning and ends with review and a retrospective. And there was a question here, are there any issues with combining the retrospective and the planning ceremonies? And the answer to that is yes. Now, could they be combined depending on the environment? The answer is yes. And the way we would arrive at whether or not it would make sense is who's going to be participating. Um, but they would be separate agendas. So the agenda for the retrospective is what went well, what did not go well, what are we going to do different? And the mandatory participants for that meeting are the the, the team, the scrum team. Is the scrum master going to be there likely as a facilitator? Um, is the product owner going to be there? Maybe, maybe not. If the product owner is there, you know, the product owner could maybe answer questions and help clarify. But the product owner does not weigh in on what went well, what did not go well, and what are we going to do differently. That is all owned by the team. In the planning meeting, the product owner has to be there, and the product owner is the main driver of that meeting. Um, the product owner is talking about or dealing with the priority of the user stories. The team's weighing in. Maybe there's some dependencies that need to be considered, but um, the product owner has to make the hard decisions with regards to what's going to be done in the next sprint based on the constraints from the team, like velocity um, and technology and sequencing and things like that. So um, I kind of answered that from a real world point of view. Yes, it could be. It's not desirable. On the test, they are completely separate. Did I get you there? I'll keep my eye on the chat box. Make sure I got that answered well enough for you. And let's move ahead. Okay, the sprint planning meeting. This is uh, looking right down here. This is conducted at the beginning of a new sprint. It's attended by the team, the product owner, and the scrum master. And there are two approaches to deciding what's going to be included in the sprint. It can be based on commitment, and it can also be based on velocity. And the goal here is to get team buy-in, make sure that there is um, clarity between the team and the product owner as to what the definition of done looks like for the user stories that are going to be included in the sprint. And, um, of course, it should be realistic and achievable. And, you know, there can be a little bit of, of um, an issue where you've got, you know, a well-meaning product owner that's driving really hard and the team says, you know, we can do these sprints and the product owner is saying, no, come on, you got to do at least one more. i got to have this one in this sprint. Um, you could get a question like that and it might be, what would the Scrum Master do if you had a dominant product owner that's trying to persuade the team to do more than the team thinks it can do. Um, and that's where the Scrum Master comes in. The Scrum Master plays the role of the mentor, the coach, and, uh, you know, assisting in the resolution of those kinds of issues without deciding. The Scrum Master is not a decider. The team decides uh, when it comes to how, and the product owner decides when it comes to what. Okay, <clears throat> the Scrum meeting, uh, daily Scrum, we've talked about it, right? The entire team attends the meeting. Could the product owner be there? Yes. Does the product owner need to be there? No. Sometimes the product owner can be, uh, you know, an impediment to the meeting, um, but would be welcome. But if the product owner started asking questions or became the focus of questions being asked, 
uh, the scrum master would have to help facilitate a change because um, that would not be effective for the daily scrum. Duration, 15 minutes. We talked about that. And the agenda. What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? And what are my impediments? <clears throat> the sprint review. Now, who attends? It's going to be the team, the product owner, the scrum master, and potentially others. So optionally, others you know, that we would want to get feedback from would be end users, um, operations folks, the suits. Um, all of those would be welcome depending on the relevance of the software that's being demoed and being um, uh, subject to the acceptance testing and the product owner, you know, giving the thumbs up or the thumbs down when it comes to acceptance. The duration for this, we mentioned this before, it's not just a flat two hours, it's one hour per week. So if you did a four-week sprint, you would plan on the review being a maximum of four hours in duration. The agenda is to demo the completed software, get feedback, and then see where we are when it comes to the, the release plan. The retrospective, who is there? It's attended by the team. And I would modify this slightly, and I would say this is the, the mandatory group that needs to be there. Um, optionally, the scrum master would be there. Potentially, you could have a, an external facilitator. The role of the scrum master would be the facilitator. Now, um, a good scrum master being a facilitator in a retrospective would have some knowledge of control charts, the five whys, um, um, Ishikawa diagrams, things like that. And although the scrum master would not be participating in the actual use of the tools, the scrum master would be facilitating the effective use of those tools. Um, when it comes to duration, the rule is 45 minutes for each week. Ooh, that was a good four. That was kind of a lousy five. <laughs> so if you had a uh, two-week um, uh, sprint, then you would have an hour and a half retrospective max. And what's the purpose? There's uh, the agenda for the retrospective, three questions. What worked well? What did not go well? What are we going to do different? And it's not just a chat session. Well, that would be part of it. You will use tools and techniques, um, like some that I mentioned, control charts, um, Ishikawa diagrams, um, five whys. There's a number of things that you might use. Uh, in order to surface uh, assignable causes for issues so that we could then come up with a resolution to those. Um, this is where continuous improvement um, is uh, going to happen. Um, you know, continuous improvement is the result of other things, but this is the main thing. And if you were to get a question about the relevance or the necessity of retrospectives, there is no equivocation. You do a retrospective after every sprint. Um, if you don't do a retrospective, um, if you don't, then um, there's no improvement. Um, you know, things just stay static. Okay, so we talked about the four main ceremonies, right, in uh, a Scrum project. Sprint planning, you with me? Daily stand-up, the sprint review, and then the sprint retrospective. All considered mandatory for effectively doing Scrum. And not doing them uh, or one of them would be considered a fail. Okay, artifacts that we use when it comes to Scrum. Uh, we've talked about the product backlog. We talked about the sprint backlog. There's also um, a release backlog. Uh, depending on the size of the project, it might be advisable to uh, group user stories into releases. Um, if you have a product roadmap, uh, your releases would line up for that. Um, for example, I've got a... Um, uh, a real life project that I'm working on, and my product roadmap is um, uh, got three versions, 
it's a website. Um, the first uh, version is free. Uh, the second version includes a membership component, and the third uh, version includes um, a referral commission uh, portion to it. And so I will then uh, do three releases. I'll have all the user stories that will result in version one, all the, the user stories that re result in version two. So that's what the release uh, backlog is. And so if you look at it in sequence, the product backlog is the overall scope of the project. The release backlog is a subset of the product backlog. And then the sprint backlog would be a subset of the release backlog. The product backlog might look something like this. Um, it's a list of user stories that are written by the product owner and are going to be developed by the um, team members. And didn't we have, we had a product backlog for the thing that we did this morning, right? So here's another example of a product backlog. Um, uh, this is more of a list um, and it just has the title. There would be a user story card for each of the items in the product backlog. Um, but the idea would be it would be prioritized. Uh, there could be user stories that are added or removed depending on what the product owner wants. Product owner owns the product backlog. Um, that's a given. Uh, does the product owner create all the user stories for the product backlog in isolation? No, absolutely not, because there are technical considerations that the product back or the product owner might not um, even consider. The product uh, owner's perspective is more the customer side, the end user side, um, and so the product owner might not even think of things like security or architecture related things um, and there might even be uh, user stories that come from the technical domain that need to be uh, developed before some of the uh, products owners user stories another artifact is the definition of done the definition of done is primarily a checklist and this is what forms the agreement between the product owner and the team um, as to when we consider something completely done. And if we look down here, it's um, – uh, where's my – I'm looking for my cursor. It says here, it's usually prepared by the Scrum Master in consultation with the team. Um, that is, I would modify this slightly. Um, the definition of done is really driven by the team. The, see, the Scrum Master is never a decision maker. If you have a Scrum Master that's saying, we have to have this in the definition of done, then that's an infringement on the empowerment of the team. I agree that the, the Scrum Master is a part of the effort to develop the definition of done, um, but I would kind of flip that. Uh, the Scrum Master is the facilitator. It's the team that still um, owns that. So um, now, is the product owner involved in this? Absolutely, because the product owner is involved in defining the story and what a fully implemented story looks like. So here's a list, <clears throat> a short list of what a definition of done could look like. The story has been fully implemented or the code completed as described. Um, automated unit tests have been developed with at least 80% code coverage. Um, it could be more than that. Um, this is just an example. Automated unit tests and acceptance tests of the story are passing. No severity has one or two defects. And then high priority test cases have been automated and added to the regression suite. Um, the definition of done, we point out, is likely to evolve as the team's maturity increases as the project advances. There are three distinct roles in Scrum. The Scrum Master, the Product Owner, and the Development Team. The Scrum Master assists both the Development Team and the Product Owner. 
The Scrum Master works with the product owner to maximize return on investment. The Scrum Master empowers the development team by fostering creativity, removing impediments, and coaching and mentoring as appropriate. The product owner is responsible for project success by defining the project vision, requirements, and priorities. The product owner has to resist the temptation to manage the team or add more important work after a sprint has begun. The product owner has to be willing to make the hard choices during sprint planning. The development team is comprised of five to nine members with a mix of roles and has the autonomy to self-organize and choose how best to meet the goals of the product owner and is responsible for the same. A scrum master is a skilled servant leader. A scrum master has very little formal authority. However, he or she is expected to assist the team achieve the intended outcomes without interfering with the team's autonomy. The scrum master facilitates the scrum ceremony such as sprint planning, daily stand-up, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. The scrum master removes obstacles or impediments faced by the team. The scrum master is also a process coach and mentor. The scrum master must not be a line manager of the team. The scrum master is not to be a task master either. The scrum master is not a technical or design authority, nor is he or she a decision maker for the team. Throughout the course of the project, the scrum master must not do anything to rob the team of its empowerment and ability to self-organize. Let's talk about the attributes of a scrum master. Scrum masters need to exhibit responsibility. Even though they are not solely accountable for the team's output, they will consider it their responsibility to remove anything that impacts the team's productivity. They will try to enable the team to do the best that it can. They are humble. They will work in the background and let the team take all the glory. They will use we statements and seldom use any I statements. They are able to set aside their ego and shower all their attention on the team. They are by nature collaborative. They will encourage the team to have conversations among each other and with other stakeholders outside the team. They will nudge all the right people into getting involved and work together in trying to solve problems. They are committed to the team cause. Even if being a scrum master is a part-time task for them, they will give the highest priority to the team's needs. Hence, the scrum master's work allocation, especially if they are part-time, needs to take this into consideration. They are able to influence. They are naturally good communicators and able to convince others to adopt different approaches. They apply various techniques to mobilize organizational resources when required, walk the political tightrope when required, and in general, do whatever it takes to get the team the assistance it needs. They are knowledgeable. It is clear that as process coaches for the team, scrum masters need to be experts in the method. They may not be the technical or domain experts. However, they are knowledgeable enough to be able to have productive conversations about the project being done by the team. Tasks for the Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is a crucial role and it is important for you to be able to be clear about exactly how the Scrum Master serves the team. Scrum Masters are servant leaders. This means that they put the team before themselves and assist the team. For example, they set up and ensure that the Scrum ceremonies are effectively carried out. They ensure that there is smooth flow of information within and outside the team and that there is a spirit of collaboration in decision making and problem solving. Scrum masters must make it their mission to resolve issues that hinder team progress. It doesn't matter what the nature of the issue is, a scrum master needs to mobilize the right resources within the organization to resolve those issues in a timely manner and escalate promptly if that does not happen. We need to understand that in the short duration of a sprint, even a few hours of being stuck
can make the difference between a successful and unsuccessful sprint. Scrum masters protect the team. They ensure that the team is not disturbed or asked to deviate from their commitments. If pressure mounts due to unreasonable expectations, they will step in and push back on the team's behalf. They will also play the role of peacemaker when conflict arises by encouraging the parties to focus on the issue, discuss the issue with an open mind, and resolve the conflict. Finally, scrum masters are the process coaches of the team. They use their understanding of agile methods, and scrum in particular, to guide the team through the do's and don'ts of scrum. They ensure that the team stays true to the principles of agile development. Scrum master roles, scrum teams. Before we discuss the role of a developer on a scrum team, let's talk about the desirable characteristics of scrum teams. They should be small and nimble. Team size should be no less than three and no more than nine. So that would be six plus or minus three. Exceptions are possible, but uncommon. The small attribute makes the team nimble and improves productivity. It avoids the phenomenon Mike Cohn calls social loafing and instead produces focus on work. The team size should be just large enough that the team members are able to produce and showcase a significant increment of work at the end of each sprint. Sprint after sprint. Self-sufficient and cross-functional. For example, if a team needs user interface development skills, database expertise, and service expertise, all of those skills must be present on the team. Ideally, team members are generalizing specialists. Team members should not only be an expert or a specialist at one aspect of the development effort, but should also have enough skills and knowledge to fill in in other roles as necessary. For example, if you are a UI developer, you should be able to don the hat of a services developer if needed. If a large team is to be split up into smaller scrum teams, scrum favors feature teams over component teams. Autonomous and self-organizing. Teams choose for themselves how they are going to organize and meet the goals of the product owner. No one gets to dictate to the team how to get their work done. The team decides in collaboration with the product owner, the project direction, and the pros and cons of different approaches. Let's talk about some key decision points or factors to consider when assembling scrum teams. Feature teams over component teams. The first issue is whether it's best to align team members based on features or components. Scrum favors feature teams over component teams. For example, it's best to avoid putting all of the UI developers together and all of the API or services developers together. Why? Because each feature or user story will require both the UI and services or API. Organizing based on components will reduce the incentive to collaborate. The only reason component teams may be justified would be if the components are likely to be used by multiple other teams. Assemble the right people. It's important to get the right mix of people together for the team. The right level of technical and domain expertise. Teams will naturally have both senior and junior level developers. This works perfectly as there will be stuff that is more appropriate for the junior developers and stuff that is not. Also, one of the risks of a small team is that the team may miss out on broader perspective and dissenting views. One way to work around this is to deliberately favor diversity in all aspects, gender, ethnicity, personality traits, etc. It may take some time for the team to advance through the storming stage of team development and develop the trust necessary to work effectively together, but it can be done. Once a team has been formed, it's best to preserve and assign whole teams rather than individuals to projects. It's best to avoid assigning team members to multiple projects at the same time. Distributed team. A distributed team may be unavoidable. Those based 
at the same geographical location should be co-located in the same team room. And technology processes and ground rules should be put in place to overcome the disadvantages of all team members not being co-located. Plotting team size and productivity will likely result in an S-curve. You can see here that a team can actually be too small or too large. Remember the sweet spot is 6 plus or minus 3. Think of Scrum as a lightweight framework that utilizes principles and practices that assist teams in delivering working software in short cycles to the customer, enabling rapid feedback, continuous improvement, and quick response to change. It promotes delivering value, as in working software to the customer, in an incremental and iterative way. It is not a process or technique for developing software. Rather, it is a framework within which various processes, techniques, and practices are employed. In Scrum, the iterations that deliver working software to the customer are called sprints. In each iteration, or sprint, results in potentially shippable software. This slide is a graphical representation of an agile project using Scrum. Starting at the left, you can see that the product owner owns the product backlog and in collaboration with the team develops the user stories or requirements for the project. The product backlog is prioritized with the higher priority items occupying the top of the product backlog. In collaboration with the product owner, the team decides how to group the user stories into releases based on the product roadmap. Once the release planning has been completed, the user stories are then selected for a sprint. The duration of the sprint is going to be two to four weeks. Once the sprint backlog has been determined, the team then disaggregates each user story into tasks. During each sprint, the user stories are developed. As the code is written, it is integrated into the system and daily scrums are held. At the end of a sprint, there is a sprint review where the working software is demonstrated and presented to the customer for acceptance. The team then conducts a sprint retrospective. During the retrospective, the team looks at primarily three things. What went well, what did not go well, and what should be done differently going forward. The team's velocity is then updated, as are the information radiators, which transparently display the status and progress of the project, and then the cycle repeats itself until the project is complete. A sprint is an iteration in Scrum. At the beginning of a project, the Scrum team determines the duration of sprints for the project. Most sprints are going to be two to four weeks in duration. Factors affecting sprint duration include the stability of the product backlog. Once a sprint has begun, the duration is never changed, nor are any user stories added or removed. Therefore, if many changes are expected, a shorter sprint duration would be best. However, if the product backlog is relatively stable, a longer sprint duration may be appropriate. Overhead. There are overhead costs associated with each sprint. For example, every sprint is going to have a sprint planning meeting, a sprint review, and a sprint retrospective. If a team has been able to lower these overhead costs by automated testing, continuous integration, etc., these costs can be absorbed more easily, making shorter sprints more desirable. However, if these overhead costs remain high, the team may need to use longer duration sprints. A team may be tempted to extend the duration of sprints in an effort to hide their inefficiencies. Remember, agile projects favor shorter duration sprints, and it is the Scrum Master's responsibility to coach and mentor the team so it can reduce waste, irregularities, and overuse, and make the sprint shorter. The goal of a sprint is to deliver working software. At the conclusion of each sprint, the team should be able to deliver near-releasable or potentially shippable software. This is not easy, especially for an existing product with a lot of legacy features, but it can be done with the right technical practices and mature development processes. Once the sprint duration has been determined and the user stories for the sprint have been selected, 
The duration of the sprint cannot be altered, nor can any user stories be added or removed. The sprint will end at the appointed time, irrespective of whether the team has met the sprint goals or not. This allows for effective continuous improvement. If the team is unable to deliver the working software as planned, the team will have to figure out why that happened and then make changes to improve going forward. The product owner may choose to cancel or terminate a sprint in specific situations. For example, a significant change in priorities or a mid-course correction may render the current sprint backlog invalid. Given that we are only talking about a couple of weeks of work, the cancellation of a sprint would be an extremely rare event. A sprint will begin with a sprint planning meeting and end with a sprint review and retrospective. There are three backlogs used in Scrum. The product backlog, the release backlog, and the sprint backlog. The product backlog is the master container of all the user stories for the project. The product backlog is continually pruned or prioritized so that maximum value is delivered to the customer. The release backlog is a subset of the product backlog. Releases support the product roadmap and each release is populated with user stories necessary for that release. The sprint backlog is a subset of the release backlog and contains the user stories to be developed in the sprint. As we said, the product backlog contains the user stories for the entire project and it is the responsibility of the product owner. User stories are features, functions, or requirements that deliver value to the customer. However, the product backlog will also have to contain technical or non-functional user stories necessary for the system to work properly. The product backlog may also include risk or defect related user stories. The product owner is responsible for keeping the product backlog current and up to date. This is accomplished by pruning the backlog, which is prioritizing and reprioritizing. The product backlog must also be continually groomed. This is the process of adding and removing user stories based on the needs and desires of the customer. There are four scrum ceremonies, the sprint planning meeting, the daily scrum, the sprint review, and the sprint retrospective. Let's take a detailed look at each of these ceremonies. The sprint planning meeting is time boxed at two hours for each week of the sprint. If the sprint is going to be two weeks in duration, then the time box will be four hours. If the sprint is going to be four weeks in duration, then the time box for the sprint planning meeting will be eight hours. It should be attended by the complete scrum team, including all roles. The most important aspects of this meeting are the team's capacity and the definition of done. There are two approaches to selecting user stories for a sprint. One is based on the velocity of the team. The other is commitment driven. Team buy-in is critical and the goals of the sprint should be clearly understood and the desired outcomes should be clearly articulated with the definition of done. Then there's the daily scrum. The time box for the daily scrum is 15 minutes, regardless of the duration of the sprint length. The entire scrum team, including all roles, should attend the daily scrum. Each development team member individually answers three questions. What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? And what are my impediments? This is how the team members coordinate their work and the scrum master learns of the impediments he or she should be taking care of. The sprint review takes place at the end of the sprint and is time boxed at one hour for each week of the sprint. So if the sprint were four weeks in duration, the sprint review meeting would be four hours. It should be attended by the complete scrum team, including all roles, plus any other stakeholders who are interested in project success. The purpose of the review is to demonstrate working software and obtain and assess feedback. Feedback may range from full acceptance of the completed software to complete rejection. The sprint retrospective takes place after the conclusion of the sprint review and is time boxed at 45 minutes for each week of the sprint. So if the sprint has two weeks in duration, then the retrospective would be one and a half hours in length. 
It should be attended by the complete scrum team, including all roles. However, the product owner's attendance is considered optional. During the retrospective, the team answers four questions. What worked well? What did not work well? What should be done differently? And what still puzzles us? One or several problem detection techniques may be used in the retrospectives, and this ceremony is a vital part of continuous improvement. At the conclusion of the retrospective, the team's velocity and the project's information radiators are updated. Then the next sprint planning meeting takes place, and this cycle continues until the project is complete. The definition of done is an important artifact for a scrum team. It is the primary reporting mechanism for team members and there may be a different definition of done at various levels. Definition of done for a feature or user story. The definition of done for a sprint and the definition of done for a release. It's really just a checklist of activities that add verifiable and demonstrable value to the product. It's created by the Scrum Master in consultation with the team. A sample list of the items for the definition of done criteria is given here. The story is fully implemented or code completed as described. Automated unit tests have been developed with at least 80% code coverage. Automated unit tests and acceptance tests in the story are passing. High priority test cases have been automated and added to the regression suite. Note, this is only meant to be an example. Each team's definition of done will vary slightly depending on the maturity of the team and the specific situation of the team. The product team has taken up a new project called Weathermaster. The team is planning to move to Scrum methodology and this is an outline of its first Scrum meeting. Time box to 15 minutes, Rick is the scrum master of this meeting where the team members discuss what they did yesterday, their plans for today, and the impediments they faced. All team members are standing up, including Todd, who's joined the meeting via video chat. Rick holds the meeting near a scrum board. Angela, the product owner, is absent. Rick reiterates that all discussions would be parked until after the scrum meeting and encourages his team to keep the meeting short. People can chime in to resolve obstacles. Hi team, welcome to the daily stand-up meeting for the product team on Project Weathermaster. We are in Sprint 1 and today is the second day. As we are planning to transition to Scrum methodology, I hope you will find this daily stand-up meeting helpful. In this meeting, you will provide information about what you did yesterday, what you plan to do today, and what challenges you faced. I think everyone's here. Let's start. I don't see Angela. Shouldn't she be here? I did add Angela as an optional attendee to this meeting, and since she hasn't showed up, we don't have to wait for her, Susan. Scrum doesn't provide a specific yes or no about the product owner's participation in the daily Scrum. The PO's primary role is to provide direction and clarify requirements and priorities. Since we don't always discuss those in detail at this meeting, the PO is not required to be here. If the POs want to attend, they are generally in listen-only mode for the duration of the meeting. They can use the information gathered during the meeting for separate offline conversations. What about Todd? He works from his home office, right? Todd will be a part of the meeting through video chat. It is important that we include every team member in the meeting. Hi Todd, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Am I audible? Yes, Todd. Team, let's all stand up for the meeting.
Why don't you go first, Aaron? Yesterday, I was working on creating the mock objects to mask the database calls from the unit tests. The difficulty with this approach is that our server-side logic is so dependent on the metadata that writing a true mock is a mammoth exercise. There are decisions that are taken during runtime based on the data. Some of the stored procedure calls are also made based on the values returned through inline queries that are also embedded in the code. I was debugging the code until about 9 p.m., but for the life of me, I couldn't figure this out. Aaron, could we request you to be concise when you provide an update? If you think some of the details you describe might be interesting to others, why don't you write a wiki page on it and share the link? So, getting back to your update, did you finish the task yesterday? No, it turned out to be much more complex than I had imagined. I'll continue to work on it today and see if I can figure out an XML structure to mock the schema and hard code some return values. But I am really stuck as far as the inline queries are concerned. I know what you're talking about. There is a reason why the inline queries are there in the code. This is mainly for performance reasons when the overheads of making a procedure call based on a metadata value and then processing the... Sorry for the interruption again, guys. This is a really great conversation. May I suggest we write this issue in the parking lot? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Rick. Let me explain. What Aaron just brought up is a blocking issue. Team members should bring these up during the daily scrum so that everybody knows that one of the team members is stuck. However, the daily scrum is not necessarily the meeting where solutions to every obstacle can or should be found. It looks like Mary knows a thing or two about the issue that Aaron has brought up. Let's jot this down as a parking lot topic. This means the team can have offline conversations after the daily scrum to track it down. I'm also going to make a note that will track the impediment Aaron faced daily until it is removed. You should let me know if I can help in any way, right? Aaron, is there anything else you would like to say? No, I am done. Thanks. Yesterday, I worked on developing the wizards for bulk order creation. I'm almost done. Today, I need to write code to handle some of the exception scenarios before I can get them over to Susan for testing. That's it for me, I guess. Did you forget to mention any impediments? Not really an impediment at present, but I would like to mention that my computer probably needs to be upgraded with more RAM. It has been slow for the past few weeks. Okay, I wrote up some scenarios to test the bulk order wizard. I'm looking to get my hands on the code as soon as Mary is done. Today, I'm also hoping to complete the company order testing that has been pending for a while. I'm okay for the moment, but I do have one question. Shouldn't we all be updating the task board as we speak? We could. It is up to you guys if you think you want to do this during the meeting. If you ask my opinion, we should update the board as soon as we are ready to move the tasks and not wait for the meeting. This will ensure that the board is always up to date and also that we use the meeting time to focus on the conversations. That's a great point, Rick. I can't see the board very well from here anyway, so maybe we should find a way to create an electronic version of it too at some point. Great point, Todd. Why don't you go next with your updates? All right. Hey, Rick, would you like to know about my work on the advertising module first or the integration server? Whatever the team decides is fine with me. Remember, this is really your meeting, and I'm only here to facilitate and ensure we get the most out of this meeting. Alright then, I guess I'll start with the integration server. I would like to inform everybody that I managed to set up the integration server that we can use as a sandbox to test the code before checking it in source control. I'll send everybody a link with some instructions and credentials. I have also started looking at the stories for the advertising module. It looks like there are a lot of open statements in the stories that I don't really understand. I guess I should have been paying more attention during the sprint planning. 
I really need to have a conversation with Angela about this. That is my main impediment right now. I sent her an email, but haven't received a response yet. I don't have anything new to add today. I'm almost through with setting up our project on the freeware tool that I downloaded yesterday. I'll show you guys a demo in the meeting I set up later today. I'll try to chase down some of these parking lot items. Anything else before we close the meeting? All right, that's it for today. Have a great day. Do you have a moment to chat about the inline queries real quick? The purpose of a Scrum meeting is to keep the team members updated and resolve any impediments. It's an ideal way to kickstart the day on a positive note. The Scrum Master reinforces the sense of the self-managing team, facilitates communication between team members, brings the team's focus back to what's important, and supports improvement. So before we dive into the differences between Scrum and Kanban, let's have a look at what exactly Scrum is. Scrum is a simple agile project management framework that is used by organizations to help teams collaborate, handle unpredictability, and complex projects or products while ensuring the products delivered are of the highest value. It describes a set of meetings, tools, and roles that enable teams to work in sync and help them structure themselves and manage their work. Scrum is one of those things that's really easy to understand but very difficult to master. And although Scrum is seen to be used generally by software development teams, its principles and themes are pretty universal and can be used with just about all kinds of teamwork. With Scrum, teams are able to learn from their experiences, what worked out, what didn't, and things like that. They're also able to organize themselves to handle their problems effectively and basically improve themselves by reflecting on them. So how does Scrum work? Here we have the first component, the product backlog. The product backlog consists of a list of tasks that need to be completed so that the goals of the stakeholders are achieved. Then the team decides what tasks from the product backlog they want to take up and deliver in a two to four week period called Sprint, hence the name Sprint Planning. Next, the tasks that were discussed in the previous phase are added to the sprint backlog. This is a set of tasks which will be focused on in the ongoing sprint. Following this, the scrum team, which is usually 5 to 9 members strong, will work on these tasks. Now, they also have regular scrum meetings where they talk about their victories, the issues they face, and what they plan to do in the next 24 hours. And then they have the sprint review. The sprint review is a meeting during which the team shows what they accomplished during the sprint. Now during this time questions are asked, observations, feedback and suggestions are made. The product owner also gets feedback for upcoming sprints from stakeholders. They also have a sprint retrospective. Now during this session, past mistakes, potential issues and new ways to handle them are identified. Data from here is incorporated into the new sprint plan. The final step is increment. Here a workable and usable output is provided to the stakeholders. So now that we know how Scrum works, let's have a look at Kanban. Kanban comes from the Japanese word Kanban, which literally means signboard. Like Scrum, Kanban is a popular agile framework that is a visual system by which the work can be managed with ease as it progresses. Kanban uses something known as the Kanban board to make these things possible. With this, you can easily identify bottlenecks and then fix them cost-effectively at optimal speeds. The main focus with Kanban is transparency. Since everything related to the tasks are on the board, everyone can keep themselves updated. It also ensures the teams focus on their current tasks until they're done. 
This limits the amount of work that's in progress. So on the Kanban board, work is divided into smaller, more manageable pieces. The work that's needed to be done is written on a note or card and placed on a board. Columns on the board help represent where each item is with respect to the workflow. Now let's have a look at what these are in detail. Let's find out how Kanban works. Now the board consists of three major components. There's the to-do list, which represents items that need to be completed. The ongoing column, which represents items that are being currently worked on and the completed or the done column. Now these represent tasks or items that have already been completed. Now although this is a physical representation of the board, several organizations use software versions of the board that replaces the sticky notes with cards that can be moved from one column to another as work progresses. Now an example of such a software is Trello. So if you want to learn more about Trello, you can check out the link I'll be adding to the live chat in a moment. At this point, you guys must have realized how similar these two frameworks sound. So let's run through some more of their similarities. Let's find out how they are similar. Firstly, they both have principles of lean and agile, which means reduction of waste, and both of them are time-boxed and iterative approaches that enable product delivery in an incremental manner. Both these frameworks aim to reduce the amount of work in progress. This forces the teams to ensure that they focus on a smaller set of tasks. This also makes blockers and bottlenecks a little more visible. In both cases, the work is divided into smaller, more manageable units. Both of these frameworks use pull scheduling. Now this means that products are only built based on demand rather than forecasts. Transparency plays a major role in both these frameworks by helping them drive process improvement. And in both cases, the release plan is continuously optimized. And finally, both these methods aim to deliver releasable software often and earlier than expected. So now that we've reached midway, let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys use Scrum or Kanban in your workplace? Or do you use these software for personal reasons? What exactly do you use these for? Let me know in the live chat. Now let's have a look at how these two frameworks are different from one another. Firstly, let's have a look at Cadence. Cadence refers to the amount of time in a sprint or before a release. So when it comes to Scrum, the entire project is divided into time-constrained iterations, that is, into smaller, manageable units. But when it comes to Kanban, it's event-driven. Next criteria we're going to have a look at is release methodology. In Scrum, releases take place after each sprint which usually takes two to four weeks to complete. For Kanban, releases take place in the form of continuous delivery. They happen in such a way that changes like new features, configuration changes, bug fixes and experiments get to the users in a safe, quick and sustainable manner. Next up, let's have a look at how changes are addressed in both these frameworks. In Scrum, no change can be made while the sprint is in progress. Once it's complete, changes can be considered in the sprint plan and then added to the sprint backlog. With Kanban, changes can be made at any time and incorporated into the workflow. Now, let's consider the metric that's being measured. In Scrum, for planning and process improvement, velocity, which is the measure of the work that can be completed by a team in a sprint, is the key metric. In Kanban, lead time is the key metric. This represents the period of time between a new task's appearance in your workflow and its final departure from the system. 
Next, let's have a look at how teams work in these frameworks. In Scrum, you need a cross-functional team to achieve your goals in a sprint. In Kanban, cross-functional teams are optional, but specialized teams that focus on particular aspects of the workflow are required. Now, let's talk about new additions. In Scrum, just like handling changes, you can't add any items between a sprint or an iteration. In Kanban, new items can be added to the board as long as there is capacity available for it. Now, let's have a look at the job roles within these frameworks. Scrum has three major job roles, Product Owner, Scrum Master and Scrum Team. With Kanban, you don't have any specific job roles. Now, let's talk about representation. Or moreover, let's talk about how data can be represented. With Scrum, the board needs to be reset once a particular sprint is complete. With Kanban, the board stays persistent throughout the entirety of the project. And finally, let's have a look at project length. With Scrum, it's better suited for longer projects. And with Kanban, projects that can be completed in a shorter period of time are better. So which one should you choose? Now selecting from these two methods is mainly based on the requirements of the team. Do you expect your project to be shorter? Do you want to make changes at any time? You don't want to set up job specific roles? then Kanban is the framework for you. Or do you want a long-running project with different job roles and involving cross-functional teams? Scrum is the answer for you. Based on the differences we discussed on the last topic, you can make an informed decision. Now, let's have a look at some of the popular companies around the world that employ both these frameworks. Some of the companies that have successfully implemented Scrum are Facebook, General Electronics and Adobe. Companies that have implemented Kanban are Siemens, BBC and SAP. Thank you guys. With that, we have reached the end of the Scrum full course video by Simply Learn. I hope you have found this informative and helpful. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts. Choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.